riding in the UK's cheapest electric van as I'm trying out a new camera setup. So uh, this one might be a little bit dodgy in terms of production to what you're used to. Not that my um, production standards are ever particularly high, but I'm trying out a new 360 camera setup and see if we can bring you some different camera angles and stuff. Um, I think in future I'll probably have a, a secondary camera, but we've only got the one today, so we'll see how that goes. But I just want to talk a little bit more about this Kangoo ZE and some of the responses I had to my last video where we, we looked at some of the things that were a little bit broken on this. So obviously the faulty heater being the big one and quite some of your responses were quite amusing actually. I think quite a lot of suggestions that I just um, do what I said and rig up one of those cheap diesel heaters and you know burn some diesel to, to keep warm and I, I, you know it probably is the cheapest easiest option. It probably is the the way that you can sort out the heating in here without spending any real money and you know apart from the the little bit of diesel you need to run it it would probably be a lot cheaper than actually sorting the problem and it would certainly be a lot more effective than some of the other suggestions but i just don't think i, I think if i'm going to burn diesel to keep warm i might as well burn diesel for traction as well and and you know forget about having an electric van at all i might as well have a diesel kangoo and you know have a lot more range and a lot less of the drawbacks that this ze ze version gives me so i'm going to discount the diesel heater i think although this one person did suggest perhaps running it on vegetable oil i quite like that you know i thought it was you know a sort of biodiesel type alternative to running it on straight diesel but obviously you still do have emissions from that it's just from a, a more renewable source than um than standard road diesel but I, I'm still, I'm not with it, I'm not, I think we, we, we need to phase out burning things, alright, so I, I'm going to leave the diesel heater suggestions alone for now, I think. Now, from, if I'm trying to use this thing in the dead of winter and it's freezing cold, I might change my mind on that, but for now, especially as we uh, head into summer, I think we'll leave the diesel heater alone for now. But the, some of the other suggestions are quite good as well, so you get these little 12 volt electric heaters that you, you know you plug into the cigarette lighter socket and they sit on the dash and they claim to be able to give you uh, a decent amount of heat enough heat to clear a misted windscreen is, is the, the very common example when you look on the listings when they're for sale on amazon and uh, places like that you know they show you someone putting it on the dash in front of a really misted windscreen and it's demisting it and uh, to be honest i just don't actually believe that they'll meet the claims that are made about them uh some of them are really, really cheap, you know, six ninety nine, nine ninety nine, and they, they claim to be 150 watts, which from a 12 volt supply, you know, that's reasonably impressive, but it isn't that much when you consider that a typical uh, heater, in fact, the heater that's in this van that doesn't work, it's probably three kilowatts at least, possibly more. So, I don't buy that a little 150 watt 12 volt heater is going to do the business. Now, it might well do. I, I might be wrong on that. And they, they do. They make a lot of these things. That If you search on Amazon or eBay for a 12 volt heater, there's loads of them for, for sale. And they're cheap and they're plentiful. And I find it hard to believe that the factories would be churning them out if they um, didn't work at all. But then there are plenty of useless products on eBay that are made by some of these Chinese manufacturers and they, they seem to make them in vast quantity but they I don't think they actually work that well and they just end up in landfill so I might buy one just to try it out and just to sort of to prove one way or the other whether these things are actually effective I hear very mixed reports on them quite a lot of you are saying it's definitely the way to go and you should buy one and uh, you know it'll, it'll definitely help with the heating and stuff and some people say no, I've, I've actually I've tried one before it was terribly useless it didn't do anything give it a miss so it's quite hard really to tell which one is the is the right answer on that so i might buy one because they're so cheap anyway give it a go and, and see where we get to it might be quite an interesting test and it might answer a few questions for people that are also in a similar position and are wondering whether or not that's a, a way to to get themselves out of a hole if they've got a dodgy heater and the other suggestion was a heated seat you get like heated seat cushions like so you, you put that on the seat you plug it in and again it'll heat up just a 12 volt thing and 
They look quite good as well. Uh, I think 20 quid get you a half decent looking one of those. They look all right. Might be worth a go. I don't know. Uh, I've, I've never used one of them either. Might be worth a go. Quite a few people say that. I mean, obviously heated seats are quite a good way to warm a person up without having to heat all of the space in here. Uh, and especially with the, the mesh bulkhead and stuff, you're heating the entire space in this van, whether you need to or not. So, maybe a, a heated seat cushion would be a good, an effective way to be a bit warmer without having to heat the entire space. And so it could be a bit more efficient as a result. So that might be a, a good option as well. But I've also been doing a little bit more research into the problem with the heater in this van. And actually had some information from the previous owner as well. So, apparently, uh, this van actually had a replacement heater fitted. Uh, the, the heater unit, the boiler itself was replaced and at great expense as well with a, with a new one not a second hand one as I originally thought I, I was mistaken and it never worked and the conclusion was come to that it was perhaps a, a, a wiring or a, a signalling issue that, so the control signal for that turns the heater on and off wasn't being sent or wasn't being sort of received properly by the unit or a, a problem along those kind of lines which meant that it was decided then that that would be too expensive a problem to sort out and it was just sort of left alone. Now, that could actually be a good thing. If we've got a, a nearly new heater unit in here, then the problem that is stopping it from working might not actually be that drastic. And it might be that that can be sorted out without the great expense that I was assuming we were going to have here. So the, the you know, £1,000 part has been bought and been fitted but it's still not working and I actually I saw um, I, I mentioned Go Green Autos in my last video and uh, they had a video about PTC heater problems with the Kangoo and um, uh, they've got a, like an article on the website about it as well and it turns out that whilst the, the heater unit does fail uh, and, and it's all very commonly that's what you need to replace if you've got problems with the heater like has been done in this van there's also a fuse on the high voltage side that can need replacement as well. And it's quite often that that fuse will blow when the heater fails. Now I'm wondering if that fuse wasn't replaced when the, the heater unit was replaced. And in which case are we just a fuse away from sorting the problem and getting the heater working again. And if that is the case, that's brilliant. Now the, now the fuse, when I say fuse, you're probably thinking of a typical automotive fuse uh, you know the tiny tiny little 12 volt fuses that's not where we are here it's the high voltage fuse so uh, a lot bigger and a lot more expensive I think they're about 110 pound from Renault for this fuse that, that is in question here and I've got absolutely no idea where that resides in this van either I don't know where the uh, high voltage uh, fuses are that I don't have any schematics wiring diagrams and I'm not particularly qualified to poke around the high voltage side of the system so I do think at that point, that's where I'll need to take it to someone who is. It'd probably be far safer to do that. So uh, quite a few people recommend Cleveland and Cheltenham. Uh, obviously, they're not, not far from here at all. I'm uh, through in Gloucester, so that might well be. I might need to give them a call and see if they know anything about it. Because uh, I, I, I don't fancy and I don't recommend anybody else does either, you know, poking around the HV side of any EV if you're not 100% sure what you're doing because it can be very dangerous and I think without the proper tools, equipment and knowledge uh, it's not a good idea to try and do sort of DIY maintenance. Now don't get me wrong, with the right training and the right tools it'll be perfectly possible but I definitely wouldn't recommend doing it uninitiated like perhaps you might do on either a 12 volt system or on you know the mechanical side of an internal combustion engine car you might have a go and you know what's the worst that can happen but with high voltage DC uh, the, the worst that can happen is you'll you kill yourself or you'll cause a massive fire and cause you know damage and injury to other people as well so I'm definitely not so keen but I'd be very keen to learn but I think I would be much more comfortable if I was able to take some proper training and do it properly. It also turns out from the previous owner that the charging issue I mentioned at pod point uh, they've, they've, all, they've had problems with it on pod point chargers before and I always assumed it was a bit of an incompatibility issue between the van and the charger and I think 
they might well be right. Uh, I, I can't think of any other reason why only pod point chargers cause issues with this van. Uh, it charged absolutely fine on the BP Pulse unit I was using when I was filming the last video. Uh, it was on there for more than an hour. Charged absolutely fine, didn't cut off, no problem at all. So I am now inclined to think that there's something going on with pod point and the Kangoo ZE. Maybe it's not happy to provide 3.6 kilowatts on you know, a 7 kilowatt or a 22 kilowatt charger. I don't know. Uh, I, I'm going to keep trying and keep trying to work out what's going on, but it certainly looks like it doesn't like pod point very much. And that's not ideal because the vast majority of uh, free destination chargers around here are the pod point ones in Tesco car parks. So no free charging for me. Although the one BP Pulse Point, the one I was using the other day, it is uh, if you've got a subscription, it's also free, so that's not so bad. But it's like literally the but the only one around here is that one at Asda. So yeah, I, I'd I would like to know more about what's going on with Pod Point, but I'm not sure that's uh, they're not going to be particularly interested in fixing a compatibility issue with these old vans because there can't be that many of them around really I don't know how many Renault sold these old 22 kilowatt Kangoos but they're also be getting to a point where they'll start thinning, thinning out again so are they going to make big changes to their network just to accommodate it? Doubt it So the other point I wanted to talk about was the um, MOT on this van so quite a few of you have asked I've mentioned a couple of times in the two videos I've done that this vehicle is MOT exempt and it's never it's a 2013 van it's never had an MOT it never went for its first MOT in 2016 and quite a few people are like well why is that then how, how can it not need an MOT I mean, it's just a, it's a little van it's nothing special why would it not require an MOT and are you sure that it's actually MOT exempt you're not just driving around without an MOT and um, certainly if you look it up if you look it up on the MOT history thing it actually comes up saying this vehicle's not, not not had its first MOT and it's overdue and you could be fined and, and all this stuff. But if you look on the uh, sort of vehicle inquiry thing on the DVLA which shows you whether it's taxed MOT, it, it says it's taxed and it's MOT. Uh, and the reason for that is this it is actually MOT exempt, this van. And it's, uh, I think, it's historically, uh, so if you look at the form for applying for MOT exemption for a vehicle, the same one you'd use if you've got a car that's now 40 years old and is, is, is exempt because it's his, historic. You change the tax class to historic or classic or whatever it is and you um, you don't need to pay for tax anymore because your car's a, a classic car. It's the same form you send off, but one of the criteria that are listed is uh, that your vehicle is a goods vehicle uh, first registered before the 1st of March 2015, which this vehicle is, right? It's, it's a goods vehicle, it's a van, and it's, um, it's a panel van on the... Uh, the V5 and it was first registered before the 1st of March 2015 and it's a bit of a weird little sort of loophole almost in the MOT system because I imagine I don't know if this on any great authority but I imagine that that was put in place for milk flows um, they're the only goods vehicles I could think of that are powered by electricity uh, before this sort of uh, series of electric vans have come along obviously the Kangoo ZE being one of the first you've got the Nissan ENV200 as well um, and now you have all sorts of electric vans, you've got the Vauxhall E Devaro, uh, the Maxxis E Deliver and uh, the E Sprinter and all that so, so the vast majority of van manufacturers and a few newcomers are churning out electric vans now so I'm guessing what happened was this exemption was in place for, for milk floats and for stuff like that that you know can travel very slowly and doesn't go very far a little bit like this van and um it was in place for a little bit longer whilst manufacturers were producing electric vans and then i'm guessing what happened was someone at uh, dvsa realized that hang on we've got proper actual viable commercial vehicles now that are electric are fully electric maybe it's time to revise this and and make sure they get mot's because you know, some vans do massive, massive mileages in a year, and so they could get to, you know, their f where they get their first MOT three years old, and they've, they've already done, you know, 100,000 miles or more, and for them to then never require an MOT could be, could be pretty dodgy, so that's, I assume that's why they stopped it, but it doesn't change the fact that this one is exempt, 
So it's never had an MOT, and as far as I'm concerned, it never will, because it doesn't need one. It is exempt, it shows it's exempt, and everybody's happy. So it could actually be a an interesting one. You know, these early Kangoo ZEs, that they're available reasonably cheaply. You might not find one quite as cheap as I got one, but they are reasonably cheap, and they're MOT exempt. So you've got no tax to pay, zero tax. You've still got a tax it, but it costs zero pounds, and they're MOT exempt. Well, it's quite a cheap, easy vehicle to keep around in, isn't it? Because all you need to pay for is insurance. And it's on the road, and, and it's good to go. Now, so I'm not saying you don't need to maintain it. It still needs to be roadworthy. You just don't need to worry about taking it for an MOT every year and, and making sure you don't forget and, and all that kind of stuff. You're still going to have to fix things that go wrong with it. You're still going to have to make sure that the suspension and brakes are, are legal and that you know the body's not rusty and all those things that the MOT entails and that the wiper blades aren't worn out and all that stuff but it just takes the pressure off a little bit and if you've got this as a sort of occasional use vehicle um, providing insurance isn't too much of an issue for private use some insurers don't like private vans but um, it could be a very handy thing very handy thing just you know moving the odd thing around taking stuff to the tip and doing jobs you don't particularly want to do with your car so I think the it's definitely a bit more attractive proposition once you learn it's MOT exempt as well. So there you go. So there we are, just a little bit of an update on the UK's cheapest electric van, 2013 Renault Kangoo ZE. So it's answering some of your questions, touching on the, the MOT exemption piece as well. Quite a few have asked about that. There'll be some more MG ZS EV stuff coming shortly. Um, got a bit of a, a cost and... Um, how it went update on the long journey I took recently so you probably saw the video where I mentioned I had some difficulty with a certain charger and it had a little bit of a breakdown moment but uh, I'm going to expand on that a bit going to talk about what it actually costs to do a long journey quite a lot of interest in that quite a lot of people asking about you know the cost of public charging and does it actually work out just as expensive as petrol or diesel and I've also I've had that car for six months now, um, so I'm going to do a bit of a six-month ownership update as well, I think. Uh, there's quite a lot of you interested in what it's like to own the ZS EV, so it'll be good to, to bring you some updates. And obviously, I'll be bringing you more information about this Kangoo ZE as things develop, see if I manage to actually make any progress with getting the heater fixed. But that's it for this video. Thank you very much for watching. And I'll see you next time.